Howdy, y'all. Teacher Jimmy here with the second part of our lesson on propaganda. In the first part, I kind of taught it in the normal way. I showed you guys a bunch of posters. That is how it was taught to me when uh, some teacher way back when explained to me what propaganda is. And I understand why teachers do it. I mean, heck, I just did it. Propaganda in posters, you can show it to the students. You can explain, you know, what it's supposed to mean. And kids usually get it. It's a fine, okay way to teach propaganda. But at the same time, I don't think that posters have the same visceral power that some other types of media do. Specifically, the one I'm thinking about is film, movies. I am a huge, huge movie buff. I have a collection of a couple of thousand movies at my house in more than 20 different languages from countries all over the world. More American than anything else, as you'd expect. But today, I am sort of going to have us look at one of those, a very old Russian, or actually I should say Soviet film, called The Battleship Potemkin. This was a Soviet film made in the 1920s, and it is a master class in how to make effective propaganda. I'm not saying that this film is necessarily, I don't know, true, because it's not. Some of the episodes shown in this film absolutely did not happen in real life. But as an example of how to try to get a message across by appealing to the emotions rather than the logic, it's hard to find any better example. Now, if we had more time, I might actually have made you watch the movie, but instead, I'm going to do my best to condense the movie down into a series of screenshots, which me explaining what's going on while it happens. I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you feel your emotions moved. All right, here we go. This is Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. The setting is a Russian battleship called the Battleship Potemkin during Russia's big war with Japan called the Russo-Japanese War. The sailors on the ship are crowded together like sardines, but that's not even the real trouble they have. The real trouble they have is with the food. This shows the sailors looking at the meat that is about to be cooked and fed to them. The ship's doctor is summoned, and the doctor carefully examines the meat, being like, Oh, yes, all these little wriggly things on the meat. Oh, yeah, that's fine. This meat is super healthy, and anyone can eat it. I wish I could show you an animation of what it looks like to see all those little things wriggling across the meat, because, oh my gosh. So the, sol the sailors who are going to be forced to eat rotten meat are there getting set up for their... Uh, you know, for their meal. I always thought these little tables that hang from the ceiling are interesting, you know, so that they don't tip as the boat rocks back and forth in the waves. But after they're forced to eat this rotten food, one of the sailors has kitchen duty, and he's supposed to be cleaning this plate. And as he does, he reads around the edge, and it says in Russian, give us this day our daily bread. And just seeing that on the plate after he's been forced to eat rotten food makes him so angry that he just smashes the plate into pieces. The captain's got word of how upset all the sailors are, and the bugler summons everybody on deck to be addressed by the captain. Everybody's there. The common sailors, the marines, the officers. This man, the one turning and talking, his name is Vakulinchuk, and he's sort of a leader among the sailors. He's saying, this isn't right. The Japanese treat their prisoners better than we're treated on our own ships. We're not asking for much. We just want some simple food to eat. Then the captain appears. I'll let you look at him and decide whether or not he's a good guy or a bad guy. But anyway, speaking to the crew, he says, everyone who is satisfied with the food... Take two steps forward. The sailors don't move, and this just infuriates the captain. So he picks a random group of sailors and has them huddle together on the side of the ship and orders the Marines to bring out their rifles and shoot that group of sailors because they are not satisfied with their rotting meat. 
just to make it that much more dehumanizing. He orders a tarp thrown over the top of them so that they won't even die as men. They'll die as animals covered up in a blanket. The Marines are looking at each other. They don't want to do this. And then Vakulinchuk calls out, Stop! Don't you realize that these men are your brothers? And his words stir the whole crowd into action. They riot and mutiny, attacking the officers. They pull the tarp off their friends and wrap some of the officers up into it. They rush into the storerooms of the ship, passing out the rifles that they'll need to take over the entire ship. One of the officers is cornered in a corner, pulls out a gun, and fires. But still, the revolution can't be stopped. People are rushing all over the ship. They grab the doctor, who said the meat was safe to eat, toss him over the side, and watch him bounce on the ropes on his way down. The eyeglasses he used to point out the little maggots hanging from the ropes. They've won. They've taken over the entire ship. But now, they have to face what they've done. They're right near a Russian city. And... They send a boat to that city with a letter explaining what they've done. And in the middle of the boat is the body of the man who told them to rise up, Vakulinchuk. When the officer was cornered in the cabin and fired, he, the one whose voice first rose the cry of revolution, he was one of the only sailors to be shot down. They put a candle in his hands and a sign on his chest that simply says, just for a spoonful of soup, saying that the only reason he died is he tried to give just regular food to the people who were fighting to keep their country safe. In the city of Odessa, the city comes awake and people come down to the harbor to see what's happened. People come and more people come from all over until the entire city has turned out on the shore. When they hear what's happened, they support the sailors. They know these are the people who are fighting for their country. And immediately, they send out boats full of supplies to go and feed the hungry sailors on the ship. The sailors thank them the only way they can, by raising the red flag of brotherhood so that everybody back in the city of Odessa can see it. People yell and cheer and everything looks good. And see, an important thing to understand here, back then, Soviet movies were often very, very short. And to the people sitting in the audience, this feels like the end of the movie. You know, everybody's like, yay, happy. There was a little bit of sadness, but things turned out all right in the end. But the movie doesn't end here. The screen goes black with just the word, suddenly. When behind all those people on the steps come the czarist Russian troops, marching down with weapons drawn straight at the unarmed crowd. People panic. They start fleeing down the stairs as quickly as they can go. They don't know what's about to happen. They run. They're panicked. The, and then the firing starts. This child's parents fall down around him as he continues to run down the steps. More troops come. There's more firing. People are falling. The steps seem to go on forever. People run and run. A few people fall and are crouched by the side of the steps, wondering what can they, what can they do? What did they do? How can they get out of this? A mother runs with her son, trying to get away. The soldiers fire again. The mother continues running, not realizing that her son isn't with her anymore until she hears his voice cry out, Mama! And as he falls, having been hit by the bullet, the crowd tramples over him in their panic. The mother screams and turns around and goes and picks up the hurt body of her child and walks directly at the soldiers. People are still running. More people are falling and dying, and the stairs seem to have no end. The people crouch down beside it say, It's all right. They're just... They're human beings. We just need to tell them we didn't mean any harm. We, we just need to talk to them. The soldiers keep marching, their shadows long on the stairs. The mother with the, her hurt son in her arms marches at them saying, Stop! My son needs help! He needs a doctor! These people are going, 
Please, we mean no harm. We have no weapons. Please don't shoot. These soldier shadows are long over the bodies of the people they've already killed. The mother with her son walks alone towards the soldiers. The officer in front of the soldiers raises his sword, and as the shadow of the soldiers lie over the mother and her wounded child, the sword comes down. The shots are fired. The mother falls dead with her son. And all of the people coming to talk to the soldiers, except this one old woman, fall dead as well. The people who nearly made it to the bottom of the stairs thought they were free, but they're not. At the bottom of the stairs, mounted soldiers on horseback called Cossacks. They don't even bother to have their guns out. They have swords unsheathed, and they start cutting down the crowd as they make it to the bottom of the stairs. There's a, a very young mother with her young child in a baby cart. The soldiers fire again. The mother's hit and dies. And... As she dies, her body collapses into the baby cart, sending it falling and rushing down the stairs. Somehow, by a miracle, the baby cart manages to weave its way through all the dead bodies that are already there. There's more firing, but the baby cart is still fine. A man has made it to the bottom of the stairs. He knows he should run, but he can't tear his eyes away from what's happening. He stares at the baby cart as if frozen. The woman who had marched back to tell the soldiers she meant no harm, she's frozen as well, just staring at the horror in front of her. The Cossacks with their swords are still cutting people down at the bottom of the stairs. The baby cart is still somehow is fine. It's made it to the bottom of the stairs. There, the baby's safe. It's on flat ground. It's not going to tump over. The soldiers fire again. And by some miracle, as this man watches, none of the shots hit the little baby. Then, a Cossack with a sword was waiting for the cart. And as he stares down into the camera, time and time again, he slices down into the cart. You don't get to see what happens. But the soldiers have forgotten one thing. They forgot about the battleship. And the battleship aims its cannons carefully. You see, the soldiers had made their headquarters in a local theater in the town. And when the battleship finds out what's happened, their cannons fire. It shows the outside of a theater. First, the statue of a lion that's asleep. Then it shows you another statue of a lion just starting to wake up. And then finally, a lion awake and ready, like all of Russia was wet, ready to wake up from the tyranny of the czars who had been oppressing them. And then the building explodes as in a bolt of titanic fury, the battleship's fire destroys the evil czarist soldiers. But that was just one battleship. The Russians have an entire fleet of them, and they send that entire fleet of ships right at the battleship Temkin. There's only one thing that they can do. They again raise the red flag of brotherhood and sail directly at all of those other ships. And as they do, they can see the other ships. People are waving and cheering. They're all with them. They're all together. Everybody's ready for a better, freer Russia. And the film ends with everybody on the decks of the ship celebrating, remembering what's happened, but looking forward to a better future. Guys, that's propaganda. I'll see you soon. And until then, stay safe and stay healthy. Stay healthy.